I'm embarking on an epic adventure. From spectacular natural landscapes to the busiest cities in the world. China, a place to explore the treasures of an ancient civilization. I find this really very special indeed. A culture that has lasted for thousands of years and which continues to shape this great nation. I've really been looking forward to seeing this. And to truly understand the secrets of a country's soul, I think you need to immerse yourself in its art. Time for the journey to begin. In this final episode, we'll explore Beijing in an attempt to show how an abundant food supply created the conditions that bred great art. Next, we go to the Yangtze River Delta to uncover the glory of a lost civilization. Before concluding our journey in Hunan province to experience cuisine and traditions that have remained unchanged for thousands of years. On the outskirts of Beijing, there's a place that's unlikely to feature on any culture vulture's bucket list, the Xin Fa Di Agricultural Wholesale Market. More agricultural products are traded here than anywhere else in Asia. Thank you. The amount of produce that gets shifted here is completely astonishing. 1,500 sheep, 3,000 pigs, 18,000 tons of vegetables get sold at this market every single day of the year. But what, you may ask, does this have to do with art? The challenge in ancient times to feed one of the most populous countries in the world is best exemplified by a large-scale artwork kept in the Palace Museum known as the Forbidden City, when it was the center of imperial power in China. At the peak of the tourist season, the Palace Museum welcomes 80,000 visitors every day, thanks to the breathtaking beauty of its harmonious symmetry. At the museum, the staff are preparing this precious artifact for an exclusive viewing. It depicts one of the featured myths of Chinese national identity by presenting a story of a brilliant leader who kept the people fed during China's first dynasty. Every school child in China today could still tell you the legend of Sage King Yu, this mythical ancient ruler who's associated with China's first dynasty and somewhat surprisingly is famous for protecting his tribe by preventing flooding. And that diligence, that concern for his people was a, a shining example of good governance for many of China's historical rulers, including this 18th century Qianlong emperor, a connoisseur, great collector of Chinese art, who himself commissioned a spectacular sculpture in Yu's honor. During the time of China's last dynasty, the Qing, craftsmen spent more than six years carving this masterpiece from a single block of jade. What I love about this gigantic sculpture is its, its chunkiness and its size, because it's just somehow so unapologetic. A, a lumpy, bumpy, five-ton leviathan of pale green stone that feels completely comfortable in its own skin of total epicness. 
It's really tempting to just get sucked into all of the detail. And everywhere, all of these wonderfully twisty trees and tiny bushes and pieces of vegetation like bunches of grapes, as if it's the moss, the lichen, that's covering the surface of the boulder. And just animated with this great swirling vortex of visual energy and activity, as you have all of these different workers, some of them manipulating their machines, lots of them hacking repeatedly at the rock face. But it isn't, of course, all chaos, because what binds everything together is a sense of human endeavour, this grand project that's binding together a community, a society. And so you can understand why in the 18th century, the emperor, the Qianlong emperor, would want to commission a piece on this scale depicting specifically this subject, because it's a beast of an artwork, but it's appropriate for someone that powerful. This is a whopping statement of imperial power. The population of the Qing dynasty was about three times that of the Ming dynasty. And this jade sculpture was created against the backdrop of a population explosion. This heroic civil engineer protected the people's farmland from being swallowed up by floods. But is there any truth to the legend of the great king Yi? An answer to this question is to be found in the modern city of Hongzhou, capital of Zhuajiang province, 1,200 kilometers south of Beijing in the Yangtze River Delta. For tens of centuries, this region was plagued by annual floods. As well as endangering people's lives directly, these floods threatened the crops the whole country depended on. Today, nearly 75% of rice and 50% of grains are produced in the Yangtze River Basin. Intriguingly, archaeologists have unearthed a Neolithic civil engineering site here. New evidence indicating that the legend of the great king Yi could contain more than a grain of truth. According to research fellow Wang Ning Yuan, the ruins of the dam system here, which extended from the mountains to the perimeter of the ancient city of Liangzhou, served an area of 100 square kilometers. Could this be the world's first flood control system? But Wang's team have made even more astonishing discoveries about this lost civilization. His research has uncovered evidence that in addition to controlling floods, the ancients stored huge quantities of rice, enough to feed a city of 20,000 people for a month. That, that, that's a ridiculously large number. What does that tell us about this fortified town, the culture that was on this site? It's a very exciting archaeological discovery. What's significant about this? This is a stunning addition to the annals of Chinese history. Liangzhou's hydraulic engineering facilities ensured the city's food supply, making complex society possible and laying the foundations for the emergence of great art. The Zhuajiang Provincial Museum in the heart of Hangzhou is home to an amazing collection of treasures. The thing I find just so astonishing about this is it's not only ancient, it's Neolithic, and yet if you weren't familiar with it and were told it was carved at the start of the 20th century by, say, Brancusi or, or the brilliant British sculptor Jacob Epstein, you would believe it because 
It's so sleek and it feels as though in places it's been machined. But there is, as a result, a sense of purity, a, a, a minimal quality which cannot fail to appeal to modern tastes. I keep thinking of just holding in my hands these few grains of blackened carbonized rice and to be able to connect those with this is really astonishing. Gu Yo Jin, Associate Research Fellow from the museum, is an expert on the artifact. I've read this, this lovely phrase about this piece. I think it, it's known as the King of Tsong, right? And I wonder what makes this one the most important song of them all. This piece What's your sense of the possible meaning of this relationship between this distinctive man and this really odd, strange, but powerful, fantastical beast? It seems to be about human mastery over the natural world, an assertion of a civilization and its power. What the Liangju did have, thanks to their social organization and their mastery of these very complicated, sophisticated irrigation techniques, was a hefty surplus of food. And that brought them perhaps the most important stimulant of all to civilization, the luxury of time. Because freed from the daily hand-to-mouth struggle for survival, the Liangju elite could become besotted with art. Amazingly, even in the Neolithic age, China had a reliable supply of rice, and thus the wherewithal to develop a complex social civilization. Next up, a private family meal and a mission to find out what tombs can reveal about the fine dining of the past. One of the best places to explore the important connection between ancient art and food in Chinese culture is Changsha, the capital of Hunan province. Mao Zedong, founding leader of New China, was born nearby and later attended school here. It's also home to one of the Chinese eight major cuisines, Hunan cuisine which is famous for its colorful, spicy food. The Hunan Museum displays precious relics unearthed from the Mao Wang Dewey Han tombs in the suburbs of Changsha. The occupants of the tombs were from the early Han Dynasty, way back in the third century BC. The most important exhibit here is the wooden coffin of Xin Shui, the wife of the Prime Minister of Changsha Kingdom at the time, sometimes called Lady Dai. Out of respect, taking photos of Xin Shui's body is not permitted, but her body is so well preserved that an autopsy revealed her last meal was melon. She was buried with some exotic animal bones and precious silk items, as well as more than 700 pieces of funerary lacquerware. Such is the unbridled love of food 
So it seems that in ancient times, even death couldn't stop it. Research fellow Yu Yan Zhao explains more about some of these relics. Why was it that lacquerware in ancient times among the aristocracy was prized so much and considered more valuable than, say, bronze objects? Jiangsu is it fair to say that this actually belonged to Lady Dai and that she used this set in life? It's really remarkable to see this out of the case, on the table, and it's something that is so relatable for the modern world. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, a dinner set. You know, you can imagine sitting at home, having dinner on your knees, watching the television, and here's something which is more than 2,000 years old, and it feels like, minus the TV, a similar thing. In Xin Shui's tomb, there was also a well-preserved list of foods inscribed on hundreds of bamboo slips. These are really curious, these objects. They look, they look like very thick chopsticks which have got writing on them. You have picked out nine of these slips from her tomb. What do they individually refer to? So if you were part of the Han elite, you had to be, you know, a gourmand, someone who loved fine dining. That was an important way to project your, your status. It wasn't just a means to an end, something peripheral. It was the absolute heart and soul of their culture. Getting immersed in the details of Xin Shui's feast in the tomb is enough to make anyone feel more than a little peckish. What better way to conclude the visit than by going to a Chinese restaurant? And it just so happens that the world's largest is in Changsha. The West Lake Restaurant can seat 4,500 people at a time. What can a meal tell us here about the etiquette of a Chinese family when it comes to food? Mr. and Mrs. Chen are holding a banquet in honor of their son's first month birthday. On occasions like this, it's customary to eat red eggs, a symbol of good luck. Do I crack it? Yeah? There we go, and peel the egg. If you, if you have it, 
you will very lucky. Really like it. It's good luck if I eat this egg. Yes, yes. yes. Good, good luck. luck. Excellent. No other special occasion. I mean, the amazing thing is, I mean, it's a, it's a boiled egg, but it's been really prettily decorated. That's what makes it special. <laughs> Have you got a favourite dish? Yeah. Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Great. What's inside? Oh, it's filled. Filled full of meat. So you don't have jia xi mian bao ma. A very special day for the Chen's and an indication of just how important food continues to be when it comes to bringing families together. But perhaps more significantly, occasions such as this underscore the amazing continuity of Chinese history. Donuts, please. Yeah, thanks. I find it so revealing that in ancient China, the characters for nation were soil and grain. And as I'm discovering, food, it remains integral to Chinese society today. It's the glue, the sticky rice, if you like, that binds together social occasions, high days and holidays, religious rituals, family encounters. It, it seals business deals. It marks marriages. In China, food isn't just something you eat. It's, it's a mode of expression, a means of communication, an art form, really, as sophisticated as any other. Traveling through this vast country and admiring the stunning artworks really can challenge your preconceptions about China. It's a country in which contemporary Chinese are industrializing 10 times faster than the British Industrial Revolution, but incredibly still manage to cherish their traditions and customs. That's why China's greatest ancient art treasures are still living and relevant today. Moreover, it's a reminder that it's really impossible to understand China's present without first knowing its past. <laughs>